and yesterday we had come or stopped at this particular point number 4 which is about the safe zone in case of a crash that has to be provided while designing the seat so obviously uh, we already studied uh, some part of safety earlier in the first module but then again uh, whenever you want to design a seat you need to make sure that you are providing different uh, safety factors on the seat so it can be a three point belt that you see safety belt that you see on this particular uh, seat which is revolving and uh, apart from that obviously in case there are going to be some protrusions either from the rear side okay or even in that case or matter from the front you are going to provide a safety zone uh, on your seat which is going to protect the occupant right apart from this uh, something that also needs to be remembered is that uh, whenever uh, the vehicle is going to go into a crash it needs to or the driver or the co-driver needs to make sure that he or she is wearing a seat belt okay so unless and until you have got a seat belt which is being uh, used by the occupants uh, you cannot guarantee that uh, they are going to be protected in case of a crash that is because it is going to primarily reduce the inertia forces which are going to be generated because of a sudden halt or stop of your vehicle and uh, the occupants are going to be uh, thrown ahead or thrown in the forward direction and to reduce the impact first you need to minimize or lower the amount of acceleration force which is acting on uh, the occupants okay so depending upon at what speeds uh, you are traveling and then within a very short distance uh, that speed is going to drop to zero so there are going to be huge g forces which are going to be acting because of which uh, the entire body is going to be thrown in the forward direction and then again once you have the initial uh, slowing down of your body uh, the airbags are then going to act as a supplementary safety provision and uh, they will make sure that you don't go and hit uh, something which is quite hard or which is uh, let us say sharp and you avoid injury to the occupants so the first module that we studied there we have seen this particular uh, scenario uh, crash so we have gone through a lot of uh, videos which have shown the crash scenario right so i hope you remember that we'll go ahead and check what happens in case of the next part which is safety yeah so this is the agenda for uh, today's session so we're going to study uh, how do you design uh, your vehicle for safety so there are some tips after this there are some two or three uh, slides on design of your vehicle for safety and obviously whenever you're going to design a car safety is going to be of prime importance and it is the art of protecting the occupants human occupants at whatever cost might be occurred because of the damage of the car so that means that uh, you don't care about what happens to the car even if it goes for a complete uh, let us say damage or uh, wherein you might not be able to use it again but it has to be designed in such a way that uh, the occupants are going to be safe at the end of the crash okay so again designing the car to be damaged minimally might again hinder the safety so if you design a vehicle in such a way that uh, you care more for the vehicle rather than the occupants it might result in uh, maybe a very fatal uh, accident very severe accident for the driver or the occupants okay so how can we do that there are some different considerations and apart from that you also need to uh, study what are the psychological or physiological weak points of your human body so that's the reason why in the next slide we are going to study the different different organs or let us say parts of the human body where and what part can take up what amount of g force so that from that we need to decide in case of a crash what considerations need to be taken for each of the human parts or human body parts okay so that's the reason why even biomechanics is a uh, quite an important uh, subject for uh, automobile designers so in this particular uh, figure that you see on the right you will find that some common injury areas have been located 
so the first one is in case of a crash something that might very commonly occur is a head trauma so uh, injury to the head then it can be a neck or a collarbone trauma in some cases the occupants might also extend their arms or hands so that is the reason why there might be a damage to the arms or bones in the hand and then obviously spine is something that is going to take up the entire load of your upper part of the body when you are sitting so it might result in spinal cord injuries which are quite severe and sometimes which may not be even treatable okay then you have got the hip or the pelvic bone uh, which can be again damaged whenever there is going to be a crash and finally because you are sitting in such a way that your leg and knees or knee bones are going to be in many cases the first part which is going to hit the interior of your vehicle body so because they are at the farthermost position from your uh, backrest and closest to the interior of your vehicle in case of a crash the first part which might go and hit your vehicle is legs or knee bones or if you want to extend your arms or hands uh, they might be going and hitting okay so that is the reason why you need to take care about the vehicle design in such a way that it does not affect uh, the overall or it does not injure the different different uh, body parts okay so you can see in the slide that injuries are going to occur to the body because of the various uh, g forces which can be higher than what that particular body part can sustain so the first is the brain which is quite susceptible to injuries whenever there is going to be a sudden impact or sudden stopping of your vehicle so this is because uh, inside uh, your head the brain is actually floating uh, in sort of a liquid material right and if at all you go and hit your brain somewhere uh, what generally happens is that uh, because of the motion the brain which is actually floating inside a liquid is going to go and hit the skull so that might result in uh, severe damage to the brain okay so that is the reason why you need to make sure that you try and avoid the injury to the brain as far as possible which can be occur or which can occur due to the instantaneous disolution of the skull okay so what i told you just now has been written that the skull is going to strike something hard if that case happens uh, it is going to be let us say uh, causing a damage or injury to the brain okay so this can result in head trauma and uh, quite quite a serious injury which sometimes or in many cases is very uh, tough to even operate for uh, the surgeons right even one one of the reasons why uh, we make or let us say insist that you wear uh, helmets when you are traveling on your two wheeler is the same right so we we'll go ahead and check what happens for some other uh, parts of the body so the next uh, part that you can study about is the neck and the spinal injuries which are uh, which may happen because of again the inertia forces or deceleration forces so if you check even uh, one of the most delicate parts is the neck which is supporting your uh, skull or head and uh, connecting it to your uh, entire body okay so the connector type element that is generally uh, seen in the neck region is quite flexible and stretchable to one certain point and it can definitely take a lot of uh, g loads before it breaks but again depending upon how the angle of impact is going to be it can also break quite easily 
okay so again one of the reasons why whenever uh, uh, let us say people are going for a swimming uh, in any uh, river or a pool uh, it is generally uh, want to everybody that nobody should push somebody from behind okay one of the reasons again is because it is going to cause quite a severe uh, blow to the neck region because uh, the entire head might be thrown backwards if you try to push somebody uh, inside a pool or a river so that can cause snapping of the neck so a similar thing happens when uh, you are going to be in an accident or a crash uh, because your entire body is uh, being supported or uh, let us say constrained by the seat belt the torso upper torso as well as uh, let us say the stomach region because of your seat belt is quite uh, nicely constrained but your neck and the region above your neck is uh, i guess or uh, you may understand that it is quite easy for it to move that, that is the reason why you have to make sure that uh, you try and protect that particular region other bones can also be uh, let us say injured in case of crash but these might not be life threatening or career ending so that means uh, if there are some other injuries to different other bones in your body uh, you might be able to survive the crash as well as uh, after maybe some say 2 or 3 months if the bone heals you might even be able to start uh, working again or living your life as uh, maybe you have lived earlier right so the bones in our arms legs and again spine they are designed to be stressed in tension and compression along their length so that is the reason why if you have got any um, impacts in this particular direction it might not cause very severe injury but if at all they are uh, having an impact in case where there is going to be a shear or bending of those bones they generally snap quite easily right again with respect to the age of the occupant also i guess what happens in case of a crash might change from person to person because as you age or as uh, let us say uh, people get older uh, they might lose the strength that they have in their bones right so we'll go ahead for what are the different tips which can be used okay so this is the last agenda or point in today's agenda so we will try and cover these tips uh, in the remaining time and if time permits uh, i'll also let you ask me any doubts that you might have at the end of this particular uh, meeting or session so one of the first tips that you can see in case of let us say design of your vehicle body for safety is that you have to make sure that whatever materials that are going to be used inside the vehicle body they are energy absorbing materials so that means that in case of crash you want the material to break or to impact or take the impact loading that is going to happen so in the lower cost so cost or let us say cheap racing cars you will find that most of the car is built from mild steel again using that mild steel in areas such as wishbone is going to mean that whatever impact might happen it will bend the material long before it breaks okay so that means that uh, that particular let us say part or material is going to absorb a lot of energy for a longer amount of duration so if you see any crash scenario or the videos that we have seen you know that whatever the crash scenario is going to be there okay it is going to be for a very small duration of time the entire crash might sometimes be over maybe within 5 to 7 seconds also from the moment you hit till the time you stop or the entire vehicle stops it can be even less than that time that i just stated right so the impact energy of the crash has to be taken up by the materials that you will be using that is the reason why we are also going to study about different materials which are used in the next module right next step is uh, you have to make sure that for lightweight uh, use of let us say materials that you are going to be using you can use a stressed skin okay or a panel that you have which can again uh, be used as a crushable zone the similar point that you have in the first tip 
so in case of crash you want or to have a crush zone in front of the uh, occupants so that is even why in most of the uh, expensive cars you will also find uh, even the front end of the vehicle is quite elongated okay so obviously that is also because uh, the engine is quite large but apart from that uh, they also try to have quite a long crush zone or crushable zone then you can use a honeycomb type of structure a structure that you see typically for uh, let us say radiators or honeycomb is nothing but uh, let us say honey bees uh, their uh, the place where they store their honey that is known as honeycomb okay and you can also use high density styrofoam which can be covered with a stressed skin of composite so all these materials styrofoam or composites we are going to be studying in detail as we go ahead in the next module or module number 5 apart from this you can triangulate the driver in something known as a safety cell again to prevent collapse so this safety cell is going to be an imaginary cell which is going to be uh, making sure that in case of an accident even a frontal a side impact or a rear impact uh, nothing is going to protrude inside this safety cell okay so you need to have this imaginary cell of safety around the occupants the driver or the co driver and make sure that uh, all your uh, components inside the vehicle cabin are in such a way that in case of a crash they don't expand either outward upward downward or even most importantly they don't expand inwards okay because any part that breaks and uh, has a sharp edge inside the cabin is going to be potential threat or a point of injury for the occupants okay next is uh, something which is quite clear you need to have a very clear windscreen or body work to increase the vision of the occupants or most importantly the driver so there you can use a non shattering type of clear material a glass sometimes again which is coated with a small or thin uh, plastic uh, coating which is going to make sure that in case of uh, a crash or in case the windscreen is going to break again there are no sharp uh, edges to the screen or the break broken glass which can again injure either the driver or the occupants or even uh, the people who are going to be outside the vehicle pedestrians right so again the driver can even be allowed to lower his entire seat uh, for better center of gravity okay next is to keep the fuel cell and battery away from the driver so in case it is going to be an electric vehicle or battery operated vehicle or a fuel cell vehicle so this is point is specifically for those vehicles obviously in case of uh, conventional vehicles you also uh, have your fuel tank which is located quite away from the cabin or the driver right so you need to make sure that dangerous items are away from the driver because in case of a crash if they are going to be uh, igniting or causing an explosion your driver has to be protected or the occupants have to be protect, protected uh, as far as possible okay so the next or the last point that you have is that whatever happens never compromise on the safety so make sure that the materials that you are going to be using for overall building of the vehicle they are of the proper grade which has been specified by various agencies now this is quite an important point because generally the oems which are going to be manufacturing the vehicle they do not have uh, or they do not manufacture everything in house so you are going to have uh, suppliers who are uh, going to supply different different assemblies so tier 1 or tier 2 suppliers so what needs to be taken care is that uh, you make sure that the quality check which are going to be happening for all these tier 1 and tier 2 supplies suppliers they are correctly followed by uh, the people inside the company okay so this is like what happens is uh, a designer is going to put some specifications on the drawings but then if those specifications uh, are not being followed by the suppliers or tier 1 tier 2 suppliers and if the quality uh, 
person at your end at the oem end is not uh, uh, being very strict so that can lead to uh, maybe accidents later on or injuries to the occupants later on okay so use only top quality certified suppliers for safety equipment again the cost sometimes is going to be high but again consider the value of life of the occupants who are going to be using the vehicle right as far as seat belts are concerned five or six point sanctioning body certified only should be considered again driver safety wear try and make sure that uh, there are no layers that he is going to be wearing right so in case of four wheeled vehicles these are the tips which can be used while designing okay so i guess we still have some time remaining mm. if at all there are any doubts for the points that we have covered uh, you may either write to me in the chat or uh, you may unmute yourself and ask me any questions that you have orally so i see around 43 participants who are attending this session today including me so there are no doubts uh, i'm going to start the next point which is driver's cap design which is also a topic on the agenda so the configurations that you have for the driver cap design they are generally of three different types first one is something known as a forward control cap second is a normal control cap and the last one is long distance cap so why these uh, different types of caps are uh, used is because they depend upon what is the type of vehicle that you are going to be designing and manufacturing and what is the purpose of that particular vehicle so some of the vehicles they are going to be used for uh, city travel so inside the city they might be used some might be intercity or slightly a longer distance travel and then you have got some vehicles which are going to be traveling very long distances so maybe from one end of your uh, country so in the south to the mid of the country or even from the south to the north part of the country or east part to the west part right so these uh, caps generally are known as long distance caps part c or third configuration so what we are going to do is i am going to cover forward control cap and normal control cap and today's uh, uh, let us say sort of an assignment or work that you need to carry out is uh, you need to find out what is a long distance cap and come back tomorrow or for the next lecture and then we are going to discuss in detail what are long distance caps and how they are to be designed so again to remind you we have already seen a very long video on this long distance cap for a volvo truck right so that is a cab or cabin which has been designed for long distance travel right so i'll go ahead and first we'll check what is a forward control cab so this is how a forward control cab is going to look like the engine is located on the side or on the below region for your vehicle and the cab is generally built over the engine so in most of the buses straight tra transport buses that you see you might find this particular type of uh, cabin configuration or even uh, i guess the trucks uh, which are used even in those cases you might find a forward control cab so the cab is built or the cabin is built over the engine again the advantage is that you are going to have additional length for the payload so whatever uh, material or goods that you going to be transporting known as payload you will have more amount of length uh, in this particular type of vehicle configuration so anything behind this is going to be used for your payload right so that is the reason why many companies might have this particular type of configuration okay apart from this some of the limitations for this particular type of cabin is that you will have uh, less cabin space right for the occupants maybe the driver and the co-driver the engine maintenance sometimes in this case might be difficult right because there are only going to be two points 
through which you may be able to access sorry access the engine so again if from the front end there is going to be obviously a radiator to cool down the engine even if that location is not accessible from the inside of the cabin you might have a cover on this uh, engine which is uh, let us say uh, a provision is provided to open that cover so the buses school bus sorry the college buses that we have for our institute even those are provided with the same configuration so it's a forward control cap and you have a provision to open the lid for your engine and check out what might be the issues in case of any uh, breakdowns right apart from this it is quite difficult to maintain the cap that has been uh, designed and also the designing of cab is slightly difficult because in a very small amount of space you are expected to uh, clear or have all your components the second type is a normal control cab so in this type of cab you have got the engine which is located in front of the driver's cab so this is how it is going to look like a figure is already there for your reference so generally in a normal control cab you have this configuration so i hope you might have seen quite a few amount of vehicles which have been designed like this so the engine is located in front of the driver's cabin you have got more space inside the driver's cabin apart from this the advantages of this particular type of cabin is that you are going to have less amount of noise and heat in case of a forward control cab that we saw in the previous slide because the engine is located just below the driver's cabin you are going to have a lot of noise from the engine which can be tiresome for the driver and it is also going to generate lot of heat okay so an experience maybe you might have got if you have traveled using state transport buses and uh, again you might also have a co driver seat in the same cabin generally which is uh, free to be occupied by passengers right again another important advantage for this particular type of cabin design is you got an easy entry and exit so the entry and exit points have been shown in this particular slide over here so in case of a forward control cab this particular height that you see okay so this is going to be quite or a bit more so in case of a forward control cab maybe the door might or the entry point for the driver it might be somewhere over here okay or maybe slightly higher also so uh, what what the driver needs to do is he has to uh, there is going to be a small opening somewhere over here so the driver is going to be putting one foot at this location and then the second foot over here and climbing on into the vehicle so this this is quite uh, a tedious job for the driver right so this can be avoided in this normal control type of cab yeah so the last point for today's agenda is a long distance cab Uh, like i told you earlier purposefully i have kept this particular slide blank because i want all of you to uh, try and find out what is or how a long distance cab is generally designed okay so like i told you uh, we have come to an end of today's uh, session so if there are any doubts uh, you may ask me again either using the chat or you may even use uh, your microphone now i have unmuted all the participants or i allowed or given you permission to unmute yourself so any questions that you have